we'll come back. Our next realm is Southeast Asia. And make sure you know your concepts, ideas, and terms for this chapter, even if we don't cover it in lecture. Okay, so I, I sometimes get tongue-tied because there's these different Asias we have. We've talked about Central Asia, Southwest Asia, we just got through covering South Asia and East Asia, and now Southeast Asia. I'll try not to slip and mix these around, but Southeast Asia really lies in the corner uh, between East Asia or China and South Asia or India, which are the major countries of East and South Asia. And here we have Southeast Asia. So here is a closer view. We have, uh, we have countries like Myanmar, also known as Burma, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia. And we switch to a different um, map so we can see these a little better. Now, these are what we call the mainland region countries. These are the countries that are physically attached to the Asian continent. And less attached is the insular region. And the insular region are the island that are off the coast, including the Philippines, uh, the major country of Indonesia, this country of Malaysia, which, by the way, note how Indonesia is, covers multiple parts, multiple islands, and parts of islands. So the geography here gets a little bit complex. We'll see also Malaysia here. Part of it is on the tip of this Malaysian peninsula that comes off of Asia. And then part of it is on this island called Borneo. So you have a little bit here and a little bit here. So we have Malaysia, the Philippines, Indonesia down here. We have a handful of very small countries as well, including East Timor, little Brunei, and the, you can't even see it under the dot, tiny island of Singapore at the very tip of the Asian Peninsula. Okay, let's discuss some of the physical environment. Um, these are the Himalayan mountains and they kind of take a turn and extend into mountainous regions that cover parts of the mainland area. If you look at the islands, the islands are a bit mountainous too, but that's because of volcanoes. That, some of these islands are volcanic and some of them are not. Another aspect is the type of vegetation or the biomes that we have areas of tropical rainforest here. We've discussed tropical rainforest in, in South America and in Af Central Africa. This is a third part of the world that has significant amount of tropical rainforest. At least it would naturally. Some of these areas, the rainforest isn't there because land has been cleared for crops. Another aspect of its physical geography is that parts of Southeast Asia are on the Pacific Ring of Fire. This is the area around the Pacific Ocean that we've discussed with a high amount of volcanic activity. So for example, we discussed volcanoes in Central America and that creates altitudinal zonation. It creates mountainous regions here. Likewise, it's very similar on this side of the Pacific Ring of Fire in Southeast Asia. That the, uh, the, the places like Philippines, Indonesia, where you see all of these dots, these are where you have volcanic activity. The volcanic activity does two things. One, it creates a bit more of a mountainous landscape, but two, it also changes how fertile, fertile the soils are. That soil fertility is gonna be different on these places with volcanoes. Then say this island like Borneo here, that it does not have volcanoes. Borneo here, no volcanoes. Java Island down here, volcanoes. Another aspect is river valleys. So as in other parts of Asia, river valleys are important places where food is grown, that they have high soil productivity and water. And in Southeast Asia, the most important of these is the Mekong. The Mekong River is called the Danube of Southeast Asia. And the Danube is a river in Europe that passes through or is the border of a number of European countries. And likewise, the Mekong similarly passes through or is the border of a number of Southeast Asian countries. 
there are a few other significant ones like the Red River in Vietnam and Irwadi and Myanmar and others, but by far the most important of these is the Mekong shown here on this figure. This, this next figure shows the type of, essentially the type of farming that's done. And I'm gonna highlight two, shifting cultivation and what's called rice subsistence agriculture. And so in tropical regions, normally the soil quality can be quite poor and people are limited to doing shifting cultivation. Like here in Borneo, a lot of this is old tropical rainforest and shifting cultivation, again, means that you have to move around because you have to move to places that have higher soil productivity, which declines over time, causing you to shift. But some places are different, like here in this corner of Vietnam, along the Mekong River Delta, people are growing rice, and rice feeds a lot more people. So we can break these down into two primary types of agriculture in Southeast Asia. One is called wet rice agriculture, and this stays in place, that it is along river valleys or volcanic soil, so along the Mekong or in islands like Jawa that have volcanic soils, people can grow rice and they can sustain a large number of people. By contrast, in many of the older tropical areas and some of the mountainous areas, people have to rely on shifting cultivation because of the poor tropical rainforest soils or the poor or the less fertile rainforest soils. And these don't support as many people. Not as many people can live if they don't have that type of either river valley or volcanic soils that can help them produce a lot of food. So you have a mix of high productivity agriculture and very low productivity agriculture. So again, these areas in blue in Southeast Asia where you have high productivity agriculture, the tan areas are where you have shifting cultivation, which is lower productivity. And if we look at a population map, you can see that it's sort of a patchwork of high and low populations. So first off, populations are massive in South Asia, the area of India and Pakistan. Populations are massive in East Asia, particularly in China and also in Japan. But in Southeast Asia, it's a mix. Overall, it's less densely populated than its neighboring realms, East Asia and South Asia. But you do have concentrations of populations, for example, here on the Mekong River Delta. Also on this island called Jawa, which has highly productive volcanic soils. But on the other hand, if you go up into the highlands of the mainland part, or if you go to islands like Borneo, you have very low density populations. Let me uh, go to this next chart. If we look at, if we order the countries of the world by population, India is the most populated country in the, I'm sorry, China, right, currently is the most populated country in the world. India is not too far behind and it will surpass China at one point. So those are the big top two with over a billion people. After that, you're down to the United States with over 300 million people. Now, the fourth largest country in the world is Indonesia in this realm in Southeast Asia. So Indonesia has over 200 million people. Uh, this is a few years out of date, but close enough. So if we look at the, the population by country of Southeast Asia, Indonesia is the top one. Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world and thus the largest country in Southeast Asia. The, the next one is the Philippines, which is down to over 100 million people, but the population of the Philippines is also growing quite rapidly and even more growing faster than some of its neighbors. And we'll, some of this has to do with cultural reasons too. Yeah, we'll get into that. But one thing I'll highlight though, if you take the population of these two countries alone, Indonesia and the Philippines, over half of Southeast Asians live in one of these countries. That these are, this accounts for over half of the population. And then the rest kind of, you know, Vietnam is fairly populated, but it really goes down from there. So half, over half of Southeast Asians live either in Indonesia or in the Philippines. 
And the last thing I want to include in the introduction is all these kind of odd shapes of countries, including ones that are kind of split between different places. And we've, in South America, we talked about Chile as an elongated country and Uruguay as a compact country. And here we want to introduce a couple of other variations of this, that Southeast Asia provides examples of different, what's called territorial configurations. So for example, compactness, where it's almost like a little ball here, it, Cambodia provides a good example. And Vietnam, like Chile in South America, provides an example of an elongated state, one that's kind of long and narrow. I believe the, 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 the length is over six times the average width. That I could, I'd forget the exact numbers, but visual kind of tells you what we're talking about. It's a long, skinny country. A third type is a protruded country where you sort of have a long piece of the country that extends out, like this arm sticking out of Thailand. If we go back to this map, we can find maybe another example in Myanmar, which also has a protrusion. Okay, the, that was kind of fast. So see, Thailand has this kind of piece sticking out. Myanmar has a little piece sticking out as well. That's example of a protruded country. And lastly, fragmented states. So the Philippines, you'll notice is broken up into a number of different islands rather than one single contiguous territory. So it's considered a fragmented state. So we have the Philippines, which is fragmented. Indonesia is also a good example of a fragmented state. It's divided into a, in, into a number of different parts on these islands. And to a lesser extent, Malaysia is also a fragmented state because it's on two parts one on the mainland, one in the insular part. 